Thank you. And uh, welcome. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, as Shona kindly introduced me, my name is Victoria Passau and I have been working at the Auckland Museum for just under a year. And um, we, I'm being tasked with uh, looking after the new online Cenotaph database, which has been rebranded um, from the old Cenotaph database. So if you see online Cenotaph, that's still the same thing as what you probably used last year. Uh, uh, we, our project is the first off the rank for the redevelopment of all of our digital collections at the museum. So you'll be seeing the museum's website being redeveloped as well, and that's been launched later on this year, so watch the space. Uh, you, it will mean that you'll be able to search across all of the collections in the museum collection, so that's really exciting. So you'll be able to search Cenotaph records as well as if we've got medals in the human history collection and, thing, and um, other items. But today I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background to online Cenotaph. Um, I don't want to assume that you've used it before, but hopefully some of you have had a look at it. Um, it was established in 1996 by the Auckland War Memorial Museum um, and the Armoury Information Centre, which is on level two in the museum. And just as a plug, it's open seven days. So if you've got any military research that you want to um, undertake, just go up there and the helpful staff will be able to assist you with your research. And it's been developed um, as a biographical database for New Zealand service people serving in um, from the 19th century right up until today. Uh, it also covers um, New Zealanders who have served in international forces as well. So for example, the First World War, if you've served in the British um, forces, we will endeavour to have that added, but we rely on the public to tell us the names of those people because there's not necessarily a complete list of New Zealanders who served in the British forces. So the first thing I'm just going to cover is the current scope of the database. Um, and the old site didn't enable us to sort of fulfil all of our aims, which is to enable it to be a role of honour for mili provide military history information and then also allow for personal history to be displayed on the website. We sort of covered off the role of honour part and the history element, but when it came to personal history, families leaving um, messages or not necessarily data on the, we couldn't add that to the records. And we received funding from the Ministry for Culture and Heritage who have um, supported us in redeveloping the site. And we've focused mainly on the First World War. So there are about 100,000 100, records from the First World War and 40,000 other records relating to the Second World War, New Zealand wars, Afghanistan, Vietnam. But it, it's not a complete database. It is not the be all end all database either. We don't pretend to be the one place that you'll be able to find every piece of information. Um, and so if you've got any feedback and you need us to add re um, records, please just email us at online cenotaph at aucklandmuseum.com. So that was the old site, the trusted site that was I think had been up for probably um, close to 10 years. And um, it doesn't have any museum branding, and that's a major thing. I think a lot of people didn't necessarily know it was part of the museum, and the museum's very much wanting to bring um, it in a part of the brand of the look and feel of the new site. And it had some limiting, limited search functionality, and the new site, we hope, is, is going to um, enable people to drill down deep into the data that is provided on the website. And some of you may recognise the old data forms that you would fill out and email us or, or send back to us. And it's quite a time intensive task to have to um, add that data into the database because we've got few, very few staff and a really great core number of volunteers. But we could only do it as, a, as and when we could. It wasn't, there wasn't somebody um, specifically employed to add that data in there. So we do have, we do acknowledge that we do have some, um, a lot of data in a data queue. So just be patient with us. And so that content was hand typed into the, each record, obviously. And this was what the record looks like. Um, and from a researcher's perspective, I think a lot of people would have known what that what that meant, but if you're just from uh, researching one family member, this can look a little bit 
disjointed and it doesn't really give you a huge amount of context. Because James Hargis uh, went to both the second, First and Second World War, you have to sort of use the bullet points, which wasn't clearly explained, to align what pieces of information related to what war. So the first line relates to First World War, second line to second. And then he may have embarked multiple times, in it, so it becomes even more murky to try and understand where, the, where that information was even sourced from. And if you want to ask me any questions, please feel free. I don't mind being interrupted. And uh, there's also, and it's still the same today, but we've just got some gaps in our data. It's a lot of, um, whoopsie, a lot of our collection um, is based, as I said, on the kindness of organisations and the public to tell us if a record is missing. And we don't have a complete list of Navy personnel, merchant Navy, nurses, and other da pieces of data. And so this is probably not necessarily going to be understandable to you, but we've migrated <coughs> the data into a new database and it en enables us to link the content between each piece of information and it will in the future allow us to source each piece of material. So you've got the, um, the reference field here and each uh, column can be identified so we can figure out where we got the information from because a lot of our researchers say, how do we know that wasn't from a family member who hasn't been able to verify that information or if it's from the military personnel file? So as we create new records now or enhance existing records, we can now start sourcing where that information is from. And we have, the, the site has been closed off from being edited for about 18 months and we know that the public have been quite um, worried about that um, that not them not being able to add any more information, but we have been amending and editing and updating our site, including getting um, information from the Austra Australian Imperial Forces. The ministry purchased about two and a half thousand records that we have now been able to put in. I think I spoke about this last year when I came and spoke at the library, um, but we now have got that information and it's very exciting. And then of course the beautiful Schmidt images have been put in the collection. But I think probably what you're here for is to look at Online Cenotaph because the new features, um, it is a, it's a lot different from the old site and the major focus uh, from uh, the museum and the ministry's uh, viewpoint was to enable people to add content directly into the website. And so that is why um, some of the technical um, elements are not necessarily what some of our core users are used to. So if I search my family name in here. So we'll show you, go into, oh golly gosh, why? Why mouse? I'm hoping it's going. <coughs> <laughs> uh oh. I might have to do it on the table. Because that's not going to work. Is this mouse is not helping me out. Maybe I'll go down and try. Scrolling. Oh, technology. Why you do this to me? Oh, oh. No. That's not moving at all. Maybe I'll just have to talk about it. And just want to scroll down to um, Henry William. Okay. Oh, which one? Hen Henry William, that one with the two men there. Okay, so this is my great grandfather's record. Um, it's a lot different from the old site. Um, there's, if I scroll right down, you'll get an idea of how long the records are. 
And the reason why we've done that, I'll just go up again, is to allow for um, school groups, uh, novice researchers, to be able to understand where those um, pieces of information fit within the person's life. Hi. Um, we're, we've got a second round of enhancements to el enable for standard printing and compact printing. That's hopefully coming up in the next m maybe two months or so. Uh, but at the moment it will just print as a, um, just the complete record. And uh, yeah, that's how, it seems like that's how websites are designed now. So we've really pushed for a more compact, a compact view. So you can see that it also covers the service, their training and enlistment and embarkation. And all that information was in the other site. It's just formatted in a different way. Um, and then the biographical information. The site isn't, a, isn't, too, um, isn't designed for genealogical research, really, in the sense that you can't connect uh, uh, records and it's about the service personnel as an individual it's not about assessing war and the impact that it had on New Zealand other websites like New Zealand history dot net and um, and uh, other research websites do that in a in a better way than us so we've just focused on them as an individual and then you can scroll right down so then also the military personnel file is still linked we do get a couple of Email. I have received a couple of emails about saying that the links are no longer there, but they are down the bottom. And if we don't have the military service file linked for, for the First World War um, personnel, please let us know and we'll um, add that on. Because um, obviously, or not obviously, but Archives New Zealand have just recently digitised all of their military per, uh, personnel files and uh, we haven't linked to every one of them. So if I just scroll back to the top, You can see up here there are, this uh, section at the top is sort of just a um, grouping of data that is below, so it just gives you some sort of key features. And you can lay a poppy and leave a note. Leaving a note is more focused on that personal memorial, so if you're saying that my grandfather was a really good man and he, you know, we loved him. That's sort of the place where you would put that content. And if you're wanting to provide more textual database sort of um, information, you can add that to the biographical information section as well. And um, what I normally tell uh, our, I'm going to try the mouse again, do you normally try and tell our um, users is to click on that show empty fields button which is just up there, and it will show you every field that you can add information into. So just because it's hidden and you can't see it when you turn up into the site, it doesn't mean that you cannot add information about their place of birth, their birth notes. We only have about 5% of birth and death dates on the site, so please add that content into the, into the record. Um, and that's the other thing I haven't you said. You say where we got that yeah, so no, I can show you um, an example. So if I went to go down to his uh, military personnel file, so you can click through there and then open up his record. So that's, um, this is run by Archives New Zealand. It's not by us. We haven't digitised them. So if you've got any feedback, contact them. But we can forward on that information if you do contact us. And, the, and our records are based on the history sheet of the Archives New Zealand site. So if you've got occupation information that you want to provide us or you have their place of birth, it's all focused on, you can see um, here, I know that that, because it's always quite consistent, that that place and the date is his place of birth, so Dunedin is his place of birth. You can put that into the record, but we don't want a cat, we don't need a paragraph of information, we just want to know that he was from new, born in Dunedin, New Zealand. It's not saying he was born in the house and this was a lovely house and all that sort of contextual information. You can add that in biographical information. So some people could say, I haven't been able to publish everything because it's only limited to a certain number of characters. Most um, 
most fields are only about 99 characters and that's um, done so that we don't have um, so we don't have to sort of decipher it when we're putting it back into the database. So if I go in, I'll show you um, how to contribute information. So we can see that he was, his place of birth was Dunedin. So next to each section, it has the contribute button. I wonder whether I can try and do it up here. Oh uh, yeah, a little bit. So you click on contribute. And then it has this section where we always get people to obviously read it because it's saying that we need to ha have your information um, for our um, administrative purposes, but also to source the information that you provide. Your first name is only published, so if you provide your first and second name only, the first comes up, and that's just for privacy reasons. And um, there's also the, this, the last sentence is you also have the option to keep your details private. Your details being your email address, not your name and your um, and your relationship to the service person. So you click on next, enter your details. We find that Chrome is the bit or Firefox or whatever. Um, browser remembers information, form information, because you do have to fill this out not necessarily each time, but no, every time you um, add information. So I'll go gmail.com. That's no dot there. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. It's not only every time, is it? It's every block of information. Yes. Yeah. That can be quite tedious. <laughs> if, you, if you do. Do it, is it? Yeah. Oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. Um, no, uh, it will only be. Um, it. If you, I've found that if you do use. Chrome, it does remember it for that section. It, do, it won't remember it for, if you go to another section and you haven't added that information before, it won't remember it. But if you've added stuff to the place of birth or um, death information, it will remember it. Um, but at the moment, we don't have plans to make it a, um, to give people sort of like login access. I think that would put a lot of pressure on the site. So currently, this is what, what, we, what we've got. I read that Alan pretended to be Henry's twin. Yes. Was that he was underage. He was underage, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So then the other thing that people sometimes have a few issues with is the capture. Um, and if you, do, if you can't read what that, le that number combination is or the text, you can just click on get another. Do I really want to try and do that? No, and you can add, you can click, click another caption and that will come up again. I wonder whether I have to click enter or I have to click on the thing. Can you not just tab to each, each field? Yeah. Okay. So on here it has, as you can see that I'm just wanting to add information to place of birth. But if you are refuting the information we have on here, you can add it again. If you've got the first name and it's wrong, add it again, that's totally fine. Um, all of this information is not going into our source data, so that means that we will at some point have to verify the content before it goes back into the source. And that's why we have AWMM associated with each piece of information, and that's to uh, identify to you where the information has come from. It doesn't mean that we have made, you know, we've just typed it in. It's more saying that we've transcribed that information, not saying that, that the museum is the source of the information. It's more like the museum is the source of the labour to get that into the database. Oh, God. So you've only got one spelling of the family name. Oh, God. Sorry? You've only got one spelling of the family name. There are a lot of names. I came across, there's all sorts of spellings. Yes. All sorts of spellings, particularly Richard Maxie. Maxie. Uh, I don't think I can tab to that. I have to, to click in there. Can I tab? Oh, can I tab now? 
Yay. Okay. Dunedin. It's not not normally this bad. If you have a functional mouse, you're okay. And so there's also the field that says, it's always good to click on show all fields because it shows the options. So there's an also known as field where you can put the variation. So it's not necessarily his first name, he's got six first names, but he might just have variations. Um, and that includes if you've um, married, your married name and... Um, well, what's your source for the family name? Do you state it? Because I'm coming across all sorts of different yeah, you just source it for each thing. So if you've got it from the military personnel, per, personnel file and they say that it's one way, then you just put that as the source. If there's another version, you can say the nominal roles, that's another version. And when there's spelling mistakes from the nominal roles, which we know that there are, we leave that in as an alternative name, explaining that it, it is from the nominal roles and they've transcribed it incorrectly. Because... Um, because that's how some people get entry and by the misspellings of the names. What is the AWAN? Auckland War Memorial Museum. So it, it says that it's the, um, we, we enter that into the website. Um, also, if, for example, we receive content from Peter Dennis from the um, Australian Imperial Force website, then that will be attributed to a piece of information that will acknowledge that it's not just us making that, um, creating that information. Military. Uh. Why didn't you put in the school? The First World War, young boys went off straight from school. And I'd like to know where they went to school. If you've got that information, that's great. Pop that in. Put, it in. put any information you've got. Like I was helping a person the other day and he his, um, Father's uncle, uh, sorry, father's brother was a great jockey in Auckland, well-known jockey. Put that information in. It gives people context. Even if that person didn't serve, it still gives a little bit of background. I'm just giving you an example of what the, the user-generated content looks like. It's, I'm not going to fill in his whole service record because that would take a long time. Um, so up here you can see before I publish, you can see what it looks like. Uh, and that's your chance to click back and amend, like check your spelling and all that sort of stuff. And then you click on next, publish your contribution. Oh God, my tabbing idea is not working. If you go on to find information about a relative and there are no photos, but you have photos, mm -hmm. can you? Yes, you can upload those photos, yep. Um, and I can... You can upload JPEGs, and um, that's the that's the only file type we can take. Uh, so people have sent saying that they can't upload things, and then you notice that they're sending us JPEG, uh, PNG files or bitmap files or whatever. That has to be JPEG. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the last step is to c confirm publish. So any button you see, <coughs> please remember to click them. We get lots of. Um, email saying that nothing's come up but, and I've put all the information in, but it's because they just haven't quite published it as of yet. Um, so you can see the... I was going to try and zoom in, but I might not be able to zoom in. So you can see that I've added that information. It always, you may not be able to see it from the back, but it always says public so that you see that it's um, a member of the public. And some researchers may take that as a grain of salt, you know, with a grain of salt, so they will then check the military personnel file. But if you've provided them with that source information, then it's less um, work on their part. You can add oral histories, or I spoke to my grandfather about this, any source is relevant. Most people will add military personnel file or Commonwealth War Graves file because um, I think most of the records that have been amended are from the First World War, so I am sort of focusing on that subject. So if you add images, the one thing that I do have to say is um, I have added images to this record. Anything after the nominal role images has been contributed by myself. And then all of these are in our source data. So if you were to add a portrait, and we had an image in our site, so for example, the nominal role image, that image, the portrait will not go above our source information. So even if it's a beautiful picture, 
it can't, we can't populate that top field. Um, and that's just the way that the system works. There's no way that we can change that. So at some point we may be able to download things and um, put it in, but there's only uh, a small team of people working on this, so that could take some time. Yes, they did, yeah. And so that's what the Schmidt images are of. And that's, but that's only from the Auckland area. So yes, there's a lot of them around the country, like the Berries Boys and, um, and then Hamilton Libraries have some, a collection of, a small collection of that as well. And so families have all of those in their, in their homes. And so we would love those images to, to be added, but they may not be in public, um, in public circulation. Hi. Yep, you could add that, or you could um, reference the file name of the from the site because there's a historical, publicly available, you know, the BDM historical site. So if you didn't want to add the birth, because we have to acknowledge that some things will be in copyright. So if you're uploading a scan from a, a chapter in a book, it's going to be in. If it's po uh, more recent than 1944, it's going to be you know, illegal to add that, but BDM I don't think would be. But um, it probably is easier just to add the information directly into the record because it's, it's, some people aren't inclined to open documents as they are just to see the data directly in there. Um, I'm trying to close out of that. Have you guys got any questions about... No, it's not going to do. Do, just want to cross out of that. Yeah, it's four megabytes. Um, I know that the site says eight. We're trying to get that changed. It's taking an age. Um, and so it will say that it's above the threshold if, if it can't load. I, d I don't know what the message of if the file type is wrong, but that should they should tell you. And that's the same with a lot of the fields. Um, it will have a... It's, in the new enhancement, it should have a character number. So if, for example, medals and awards, we know that they, you may want to put their medal citation in, that will allow for 2,000 characters and it will count you down every character you add. Um, and that's the same for death notices and obituaries as well. But not every field has, is mostly 99 characters except for specific um, fields. Uh -uh. Um, the thing I think, the feature that the most people have been interacting with is using the layer poppy um, feature, I guess. So if you click on that, it will take you down and it will allow you to just acknowledge that you were there. It doesn't necessarily mean that you, you don't need to put on data, you can just acknowledge the person. And the poppies are there for a year and they'll be... Um, sort of removed after every Anzac day, so the next batch of um, poppies can be laid. And we've had about 35,000 poppies laid since we launched, so that compared to having 1,500 images added, you can see that most people may not have anything to, to say, but they want to still say that they've seen, looked at their relative or their researchers, um, or the subject of their research, just to acknowledge it. And you can see that my, it's my mum has added a note. Um, and the, the date, there's a glitch with the date. She added this in, I think, February, so we're trying to fix that. And you can see next to, on the record, it says report. So you can report notes and images. If you think that there's content that you find is offensive or um, an image you, you think that you have the copyright for is up there and it shouldn't be up there, um, you can click on that and that will email online cenotaph and we'll, we'll be able to... Um, um, deal with it. If you report something that should hide the content, so if a fa if you you find something really offensive, it should go as straight as you click report, so that um, that doesn't continue to be showing on the site. Um, if we go scroll right down to the bottom, you can see when every time you add information, your name and the date and the location will come up. If you've clicked that you want your email to be made public, 
uh, the email sh underline it should come up in blue so that means that people in the public can contact you about your information and quite a few probably about 70 to 75 percent of people have opted to do that um, and so that is a really good way because we don't have a um, the museum's not managing a community of online cenotaph users it's sort of self-managed so if you want to contact people then you can do that if they've if they've provided that option um, but obviously we can't forward on, necessarily forward on your queries because that would be a big undertaking if they haven't made that information public. And then of course there's always a scene and error on this page, tell us about it. I don't know if the old site had that option I, uh, and I can tell by the number of inquiries that are coming in. We've had about 600 inquiries since we launched in January. and. Um, and Armory, I don't think, has received, received that many during the year. So um, I think people now know that it's a, a lot more um, inviting and it means that you can interact with the site and we can update it. Um, if you contact us, just be aware that um, there's myself responding and a, and a few other people, but it's not. we may not be able to get back to you that day. So just be patient with us. <laughs> but it's a huge uh, undertaking that Victoria has, and she's worked behind the scenes setting this up. There's been tremendous impact, which is great, since we launched, but it's still basically one person. So we do ask for tolerance in terms of, you know, people like to get things immediately corrected yeah. or immediate response. We're working on getting support for Victoria, but it's a pretty... Um, Gigantic job. That's right. Done. I'm a good typist. She does very well. <laughs> uh, at this early day, we can have the museum. Yeah. And a lot of focusing on that one position. Yeah. And so if you do find that somebody's not on there, it's not because we have got, yeah, it's not, yeah, exactly. It's not because we don't care, it's because we just haven't got there yet. So the World War II nominal roles we know have been digitised and are available on Ancestry, but we just haven't been able to. Um, add that information but if you've got a family member that you would like on there so you can acknowledge them that's fine just let us know we just may not be able to get a hundred thousand up in the next two months <laughs> uh, might just go back to our friend then I can use my clicker so on the home page um, we do have profiles that if you were um, what, if you had a really amazing, interesting story that you have written up, we would really want to put that on the front page. Um, and that can be about somebody you've researched, a group of people. At the moment, it's just individuals. But if you found a um, unit or battalion that has an amazing photo and you want to identify people in them and you'd like us to help you, we would love to be able to help you and promote that on the front page of the site. Also, we would like to use that space to promote collaborations with other um, uh, cultural heritage in institutions and um, and then down to our amazing um, users so please contact me if you'd like to promote something on there we're open to any suggestions so just to clarify about the user generated content so you can add information into every field as I as I showed you if you click on the show all field button and um, it's kept in a layer above the source data. So there's some um, academics and members of the public who are quite, were quite nervous about the user-generated content because they felt like that was going to be mixed within the core data of the database. And so we're clearly saying that it's, it's above. It's not being um, actively moderated. And that's the, the decision by the museum to publish that automatically. So it just, as soon as you add it, it's up there and it's available. And at some point we may be able to add that into the source data, but that, again, that takes a lot of verification because even though you've provided us with the link to the military personnel file, we still have to check to make sure that um, it's, it yeah, or it's not um, spam because but that hasn't really happened on our site, which has been quite amazing. And um, who has written this user-generated content? Did you write that? I wrote that. Your spelling of this is bad. Oh yes, it is. Oh. Well spotted. Thank you. Well spotted. 
Thanks, mate. I'll change it. Let's move past it. Don't worry about it. Um, and then just confirming the Orkhamore Moor Memorial source. So if there is, a, if we've got information from the military personnel file, we can now say that if we've been able to attribute it. And that's similar to the public ad and content as well. And um, this was just a great example of a person adding their iwi hapu information. A lot of the Māori contingent uh, used a European names, so they may not, the families may not even be able to find or understand whether if they're definitely from their family. And also iwi hapu waka rohi were not asked, that wasn't asked on the, or even the um, ethnicity wasn't asked on any of the files. So we don't know if people were necessarily were Scottish, Irish, whatever-ish. Um, and especially for the Māori um, contingent. So people adding that content has been really exciting. And we are working on making our iwi hapu list a lot more consistent, if, if you guys are interested as well. And you can see that Val um, has chosen to, to um, let her people contact her. So that's why that blue, the line is in blue. And then there's a tribute. This is a, a great example. And it's sort of a little bit um, slightly form, uh, informal way of um, remembering a service person. And it's about how he became, came back and was a GP. And um, so there's quite a few examples of this on the site. We've had a roughly the same number of notes added as images, so about 1,500 notes. And sometimes it's just a school group saying, we are researching this person and, you know, the room 13 acknowledges them, which is really great, or family member, direct descendants um, leaving notes as well. That's just a video. So I'm just going to click through what it, how it is to upload an image because I think lots of people find that to be slightly um, difficult. It's the same sort of thing as adding data. So you just click on next, enter your details, you fill out your information and the, and the capture down the bottom. And then you add a title for your image. And then you, there's on the screen, there is a box that says upload. So you can either drag the image into there. So it has to be a JPEG or you just search for the file on your computer. You add the title and describe the image. And you also have to um, read the terms of use. And at, in the next couple of months, there will be a copyright caption being added as well. So you can choose whether it's out of copyright. Most images pre-1944 are going to, or they are going to be out of copyright. So if you're adding First World War images, then that's sort of not going to be too much of an issue. And so you've uploaded it. You click on um, publish, and then you click on confirm, confirm publish. You must always click on that last button. Even if it looks, even if it previews as looking like it's published, it's not yet published. And we have to have that last um, one for our statistics. And so then that image is up and you can see, again, it's the same sort of deal, public, um, the name, the date, and um, the source. I was probably supposed to write all City libraries on there, but I didn't. I've changed it, don't worry. <laughs> um, and... I'm going to show you examples. This is probably the most complete example of contribution, a person adding five diaries to the site. And it's mostly transcription. So Peter has added a photo. That's weird. Oh, that's IE. <laughs> has added photos. And then underneath, you can see that he's added PDFs of transcribed diaries. So I think families have been finding it really helpful to be able to, to um, share their research on a public site, which then manages and saves that data. So you can add diaries and, and your biographical information onto there. It, it needs to relate to the, generally to the person, though. So presumably they would have, they have named other people in yes. the Yes. So can you search for names? You, well, you can, but it won't be searched across the database. Yeah, so if you search and open it up and then go Control F, you can search within that. Um, and if you were wanting to then link, you could link the, 
you could add a link to the person referenced using the the record link and and linking it that way as well. Ralph Dorshall Doughty? Doughty? Yeah. He was in the um, Australian Imperial Force, so he's one of the records that we purchased from um, Peter Dennis. So it was a really exciting thing to see that that had been only up about two months and that people had already added content on there. And we may have missed some of the um, AIF um, servicemen, so please let us know if you know that there's an, a, a New Zealander who served in the AIF. So can you download that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. So he's transcribed all five. So if you just click on here, let's see if we can open it. And then you've got it. So it's, uh, yeah, so he's got all of the references as well. So I think this was done a few years ago, but it's, good, it's amazing to be able to have that um, put on our site as well. So just giving you an idea of the options of things that you can add. Instead of having to fill in every field, you could add a document, a bio, um, into, as, a, as a Word document or a PDF. And also we found um, that if you want to add content in, and you don't want to have to split it all out, you could add it into the biographical information and, and list it all there and then at some point we can add it into our source data because unfortunately you, you cannot search the user generated content because again that would put a lot of pressure on the system. So um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to put it into our source system. And the last icing on the, so there's uh, quite a few other examples that um, are on there. And this is just the summary of usage. I probably should say that I've had 600 inquiries on there as well. Um, so there's been over 3,000 pieces of information. Oh no girl, why did I touch it? Um, <laughs> and 102 documents, which we sort of expected it not to be necessarily the way that people would um, want to add information. Um, 1,500 images, the amount of time that would have taken us to put those images on would have been um, a, a huge. And also it, it enables people to put up images that would not necessarily go above the museum, it would come under the museum's threshold. So we have to, if we're scanning things, it needs to go as archival quality. So if somebody's sending us a 200 kilobyte f file, which is quite small, we can't justify saving that on our system. So this allows people who um, have images but we couldn't add, they can pop them on there. So that's just so exciting. And then you can see that we've had um, two, nearly 2,400 people adding information and 1,700 have allowed people to contact them. But that's up to you guys. And if you decide to add something and then you don't want to have that up there anymore, or if your sister or your family have said, look, you've put up too much information, you can just let us know and we can take it down as well. So nothing is, um, ir is not irreversible. Or nothing is irreversible. Reversible? Anyway, so the last thing is poppies laid is 35,000 poppies have been laid. So it shows that while not everyone wants to contribute in a, as an image or a data, in a data way, but they can still um, acknowledge their um, use of the site. I think that's astounding statistics, remembering that it has only been there since the 22nd of January. January, mm -hmm. yeah. We just, and the reason why you may not have heard of the launch is because we know that Anzac Day is coming and we just had to see if the site was going to fall over. <laughs> before the day, so we will probably be promoting it a lot more in, uh, after we feel comfortable that it's not going to break. Um, and so email online cenotaph at aucklandmuseum.com, that goes directly to me, uh, but the armory is always is open seven days and they have a huge amount of books and the, the volunteers and staff there have such a lot of knowledge that they would love to, to speak to you about that. And if you've got things that you may not um, want to load onto online cenotaph but want information about, you can bring those in and people can talk to, the, to you about it. But 
just be aware, please don't bring in donations just off the street and leave them with us because we just ha we've got like a collection development policy. So just be aware that um, we don't want you to come in, take all the effort, and then we can't necessarily accept stuff because we are receiving a lot of interest about, around that as well. Do you have any questions? Um, is it correct, my assumption, or am, sorry, am I correct in my assumption that once things are more than 60 years old, for your purposes, it's out of copyright? I'm not. Pre for images, yes, no, pre-1944. And for written material, it's still 100? I think. 70? I'm not. It's, it's hard. After the, after the, is it 50 years after the author? The, 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 the author. After the death of the author. But, and if it's a record, though, and there's no author as such, or a non, or just your group. A record of, uh, of what? Well, I guess war service. Yeah, if they mil we, we prefer people not to load military personnel file because uh, the link is there already. So, um, and I don't know if our Archives New Zealand would want people to load those. I was thinking perhaps more of a newspaper article. You can you can link to those. I mean, because a lot of papers passed, mm -hmm. which is uh, yeah. So it's probably easier to link to papers passed mm -hmm. than to load the image mm -hmm. on there. Yeah. Yes, hi. What has happened to the feature that on the old site that said where did they come from? The um, place of embarkation, or yeah. So that that is not. There, we're hoping to, um, as I said in the next enhancement, have a feature that will say um, military district or embarkation, place of embarkation. At the moment, we don't have that. So you, the, we, it's sort of getting all, it's getting updated. But the, um, but yeah, we've had a lot of inquiries about, about that. And the place searching is going to be adjusted as well. Because at the moment, we have to tell people to use the keyword search because the place search is only searching for birthplace and um, next of kin address. So that's not actually place, a place search. So we know that we're trying to adjust that. Yeah, good question. Sometimes the vessel where they took the people away from Yes. There are alternative uh -huh. mm -hmm. That is confusing. Yes, because we don't know wh what you vessel they went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you guys know, let us know. Um, we have uh, digitised a lot of the um, troop ship magazines, and they, that will clarify those questions, but that's, again, a lot of work. There's about 60,000 references to individuals in those troop ships, and hopefully we can cross-check those. Um, but if you can confirm what ship they went on, that would be awesome. Pop that in there and we'll be able to clarify it. Yeah. It would have been great if they just put it, made a list. Everyone sign up when they move on the boat. I didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And just be um, gentle with us because we know that Archives New Zealand have digitised all those service sheets. It doesn't mean that we've gone in and transcribed them. So if you can't see date of birth and you know that you can see that on the, on the service sheet, it's not because we don't know it's there, it's because we just didn't, haven't had the time. Um, I should probably just plug that there is a um, project that has been established by the University of Minnesota who, using a software called Zooniverse, are going to transcribe the history sheets of the um, personnel files from Archives New Zealand. So um, hopefully we will get their information and be able to load that into the system as well and that will be able to en enrich the records. Do you have information about New Zealanders who went and fought in the Boer War? Yes, we do, but it's again, it's not necessarily com complete. If you were going to search for that, you just would go, oh, please, mouse, move. <laughs> you would go <laughs> to the war and then choose Boer War, Vietnam, Malaya, where, whichever is linked there. Sometimes we might have American Civil War. We've only got two records, so don't expect us to have a lot on them. Um, and they have digitised the, uh, the South, we call it the South African War, um, those records in, New in Archives New Zealand as well. So that's another thing that you can use those service records, but most of them are just handwritten letters. So it is a little bit more tricky to decipher. 
but yeah, so that's it. So Archives New Zealand have digitised First World War, Boer War, uh, South African War, and people who've served both in the First and Second World Wars. So there's quite a, quite a few up there. Mm -hmm. The Labour Party, that, that mentions the World War I, is it in death or World War II? If we can verify their date of death, you can. Um, that's a good thing to tip me off, is that we are now publishing people who we haven't verified their date of death. Um, and so they're called preliminary records. And so that will stop people from laying a poppy, because obviously if we can't verify their date of death, it's a bit inappropriate to lay a poppy. Um, and and yes, yeah, so anyone who died in the, f in the Second World War, who've died subsequently, then you can lay a poppy on, on them. And if you know their date of death and you can't, you can see that you can't lay a poppy. Let us know. Email us, and we can adjust it, us adjust that. But we technically can't do that at the moment. Do you have like, um, if you know that they have died and they've got next to kin away, possibly contacting if there is anyone? No, we don't have access to that information. We don't, like the um, DIA don't provide us with date death information. Um, so that's what, oh, it would be amazing if they did, but they, yeah, no, sorry. You'd have to contact the, I don't know who you would contact. You'd have to do the research yeah. yourself, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> 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 I'm going to see the research centre if you need help. Yes. <laughs> that's a good plug. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. That's it. Well, no other questions? Thank you. Thank you.